Hi. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. It's the third Sunday of Easter, which falls on May 1st, 2022. And our readings, uh, our first reading is Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, or you can read all the way through uh, verse 20. Our psalm is Psalm 30, and the second reading continues us in Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Our gospel this week is John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Great story. I love this chapter, uh, John 21, 1 to 19. So it's the fourth resurrection appearance. Uh, first to Mary Magdalene, then to the disciples, then to Nick, uh, then to uh, Thomas, and then now to the disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the primacy of Peter. I have many, many, many photos of that location. I love that place. Uh, but it's a, I think the, the first thing that I want to say about this uh, this year is, and I, I'm sure I've said it before, but it it really is a, a, mm, a new discipleship narrative or a new calling, if you will, uh, that we have so many connections back to the calling of the disciples in chapter one of uh, the fact that we have referenced uh, Nathaniel. It's the last time we've heard about Nathaniel. Cana, back to the first sign. And, uh, and so that we are here we are on the other side of the resurrection and discipleship has to be revisited uh if you will that uh that the the finding of the disciples back in chapter one was then the disciples accompanied jesus in his three years but what then does it mean to be a disciple now uh and which takes on some um some pretty specific activities and ways of being in the world that the disciples really couldn't see or experience or even understand until this place, which is why, uh, which is why Peter's interaction with Jesus is not about, uh, uh, about Peter's, um, failings necessarily as his own inability to see what it me meant to be a disciple because in john he doesn't deny it's not i don't know him it's the question is aren't you one of his disciples and peter says i am not aren't you one of his disciples i am not surely we saw you in the garden with him no you didn't and so that discipleship now uh, on, the, on the other side of the giving of the spirit and the sending, you know, that's the first time that Jesus ta has talked about sending his disciples into the world with the Holy Spirit, the accompaniment with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit inside them, then it becomes uh, possible to be sent into the world. And so that's what this is about. What is it going to be? What is it going to mean to be sent into the world now? Uh, and for the disciples to have a sense of, of what those responsibilities are, and particularly uh, Peter. What is, now, what is Jesus asking Peter to be, the disciples to be and to do? Uh, that just was not, um, not, not possible to really comprehend before now. So it's a discipleship there. It's a, it's a calling. It's a call story. Again, a call into the world. What does, uh, what does discipleship uh, look like now that uh, the resurrected Jesus has appeared on the shore? That's my first comment, kind of a long one, but yeah. <laughs> that's my first comment. I have 12 more. I have no, I only have 14 more, but that's okay. No I'm kidding. <laughs> I think one of the challenges of, of of well preaching the story, but understanding the story is is getting the emotions right. And maybe we can't get them right. And maybe that's part of the, the power of it is are we supposed to criticize Peter when he says, I'm going fishing? Some people will say, Well, that's he's now kind of rescinded his vocation and then somehow slid back to something. I'm not so sure that's correct. Uh, but then the the dialogue 
do you love me? And Peter feeling hurt that he's asked so many times. And I, I often hear that read as sad, as Jesus trying to provoke an emotional reaction and Peter kind of still so hung up on the betrayal that he's kind of bargaining. You know what I mean? That it's that he's a broken man. But what if you read it more joyfully? I, that, that, that exchange, Peter still feels hurt, mm -hmm. but maybe there is something about it because it certainly doesn't end joyfully in the sense where Jesus says, by the way, <laughs> things are not going to end pleasantly for you, you know, and when he predicts his, uh, his future in, in verse 18. So I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over that in any way. But it's an important story. If it's, it's, does that make any sense? Is, is it is it bittersweet? Is it happy? Is it? I don't think anybody has necessarily given up their vocation here. I don't think Jesus is necessarily scolding mm -mm. anybody. But it is, like you said, we know this from how the synoptics have the miraculous catch of fish in different parts. This seems to be some kind of a of a restart or of a now that I've been raised from the dead and it's all in your hands, folks. Mm -hmm here you go. I, it, you know, it's not even clear because John doesn't narrate the ascension, whether this is some kind of a post ascension appearance of Jesus in anybody's mind, or we don't know how much time has mm -hmm. elapsed since chapter 20. There's just a lot of mystery mm -hmm. in this chapter that I want to keep mysterious in the sense that I don't want to foreclose other readings, but I also want to preach something. Does that make any sense at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I really appreciate both of you, both of your entry into this. This is this is what I love about John, and it's the the continual re-narrating. Um, that uh, if you're into any kind of series, like you know, I'm into the Marvel Universe, and how it tells a story that keeps falling back on itself. And Caroline, your opening just talked about exactly that. And Matt, what you're asking us to do is to tell this story, not as a way that it's always been told, or uh, let me put it this way. When I was in seminary, we were told to find ourselves in the text. And, and um, uh, last week was this uh, recognition um, uh, of, I think from our Acts text in terms of where God is active. And that's what we're looking at in this text right now. Um, the, slow down. Um, and I say that because of, of verse one, and then uh, 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 um, uh, later on, um, where uh, it's uh, verse one is after these things, and then and then later on, it's it's after the breakfast, you know. So it, this is something that um, stop, slow down. There's no rush here. Um, uh, I know it's verse one and verse fifteen. Verse one after these things. Um, like you said, Matt, don't know how much that time is, but Jesus showed himself again. And then even in this scene, verse 15, when they had finished breakfast. So there's no rush. And yet we're starting all over again, which is the gathering together of these same people, uh, which kind of mirrors the fact that God has never given up on the promise to the world that is made through Israel. That, that God does not replace the Jews with the Christians, but because of God's original promise through Israel for all the world, here we are again at that same beginning. And then um, uh, Caroline, like you said, this noticing of I'm going fishing, fishing, it's the same person with the same vocation from the beginning being called out of who they are to be a witness for God. And, uh, and then um, the, 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 the next movement here where it begins that they didn't know who Jesus is, um, but then later on, um, we're going to get where Peter says it is the Lord. And then in verse 12, the disciples are not gonna ask because they know. So how do we, how do we get to that point where what we're talking about is not, who am I in this story, but who is God made known in Jesus? And what is God doing so that it is completely undeniable, totally recognizable that this is God and that God is keeping God's promise and that God is not giving up on us. And then at the end here, I love this 
um, Matt, of asking for it not being a sad um, moment of, of Peter's um, failure, but rather um, the confidence that Jesus continues to show in uh, humanity at large, despite our failures and despite our walking out on this story. If you read that that repeated narrative that is woven all the way through um, how John narrates, and so the the responsibility to feed my lambs, to go and care for creation. Um, why do you do it? Because you love me. Not because I'm right, me speaking about myself, not because I'm saved, me speaking about myself, but because of my love for the creator, I will demonstrate that in my caring for the creation. And I just think that that is a rehearsal of what John has been telling us all along. And it's a new way of reading the story that I would hope would cause folks to see God, to see God's action, and to recognize that God hasn't given up on us, and that's good news. Well, and I think, yeah, and I think that 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 how do you read that section and what that's all of what Jesus is asking Peter to do? Uh, that what you were, what both of you were talking about really does hinge on a couple of things. One is that this language of love, uh, we're going to, we have the love commandment coming up on the fifth Sunday of Easter, uh, but it's worthwhile for, uh, for the preacher to remember that uh, from, uh, from the farewell discourse and bring it to here. Love one another as I have loved you. Well, why, what is that? What is the meaning of that love? It's so that that love that God has, that Jesus has can be experienced and replicated and ongoing, um, even in Jesus absence. And so that, so there's a, that mutuality reciprocity here. And then the, uh, Jesus is not asking Peter to do just anything. He's asking Peter to feed my sheep, tend my sheep. And the only other time this language is used of sheep, you know, tending sheep is in John 10, where Jesus himself has been the good shepherd. Uh, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. No one takes it from him. The good shepherd leads the, lead, leads the sheep in and outside of the fold and they find pasture and so that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so essentially, Peter, Peter is being asked to be that shepherd now. Uh, so it's this is not just a it, this is this is big big stuff, uh, and 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 to and to take that on and that the the other thing I would say is that that um, that moment of recognition here, you know, for Mary it was her name being called for uh, for the you know for the disciples. Uh, what what the question becomes when is that moment of recognition? And here it's an abundance. I uh, it's 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 in that moment where there's so many fish, 153 of of recognition, and then and then to go from that abundance to another meal that Jesus hosts. You know there is no uh, there's no Lord's Supper or Eucharist or whatever in the Gospel of John. It's in John six. Uh, we talked about this last week with Thomas of Jesus offering his body once again, and then it's in, and then you have this other meal of of sustaining. This is pasture. This is this is sustenance. This is uh, this is abundant life, and it's those promises that then make it possible for Peter and the disciples to be to tend the sheep and care for the sheep and go back to John 10, 16. I have other sheep that are not of this fold and I must bring them in also. So Jesus is sending them into the world to do what he did. I think that's really important, especially the, 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 the tending of sheep is really big stuff because it sounds, it sounds a little romantic when this is read sometime or humble, but yeah, this is, you are taken over my work yes which probably has some connections as well to the giving of the spirit and how jesus describes that in john's gospel about binding and loosening but that was last week too late to go back to that one but 
I think that's really significant and in terms of talking about how does this intimacy get lived out now, especially for a gospel for John that often is treated in really individualistic terms of individualistic spirituality. But this is now a way of reminding us of what kind of community the church is corporately mm-hmm. as the place where that same intimacy with, with God is discovered and, and fostered. Mm-hmm. And it's, as you're pointing out, Matt, it's naturally in this text, which is so often used individualistically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean to be like Christ? It's to do the things that Christ was doing that Jesus was doing. And that's, that's exactly what we're being in. That is exactly what the followers of Christ are being invited to do at this point. Yeah, I, I say this in my commentary, and I said it in a workshop that I led um, several weeks ago on these passages, but, uh, but the, the fact that this, the charcoal fire is here, uh, and the only other time the charcoal fire is mentioned is at the denial of Peter. Uh, and, and so, where Peter said, I am not, you know, and, but here Jesus is saying, oh yeah, you are. This is the time to say the I am, that you are now the I am in the world when I cannot be. And, uh, and so it's, uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not a lovely little pastoral scene with, you know, cute little sheep and uh, the shepherd, you know, following the shepherd. It's, the stakes are, you have to you have to read this passage in context with chapter ten, and the stakes the stakes are high because God so loved the world, <laughs> and how is God going to do that without without the disciples being sent into the world and being that love in the world when Jesus is not there? Great story. Yeah, before we move on, I just want to register my frustration that another Easter has come during your C, and I still have no idea what the 153 fish represent. So they don't represent anything. Sure they do. They <laughs> just, it's just a, a lot fish. of fish. Then why it's didn't it say a like lot. a lot or like a hundred? Because or if you if you if you said a lot, then you as the listener are going, well, what's a lot? Like four. I'm still not satisfied. Like sixty-two. Still not satisfied. One hundred fifty-three. You can picture. In fact, I had one. Once I did this, I did this a uh, number of years ago, and I had a pastor who was like so taken with like it's abundance. That's what it's meant to, you know, because they're hauling the net and they're full of large fish, not medium fish or small fish, but large fish. Anyway, he and his family, uh, this is a small church somewhere, small church, cut out out of construction paper 153 fish. And then um, posted them on the, put them up on the back of the altar so that when people came in that Sunday, they would see, you know, 153 and experience the abundance. Wow. It's just a lot of fish. And, and I would have spent the entire sermon like counting and trying to divide by different numbers and trying different. Yeah. All right. Don't, don't, don't that's my, done. that's Caroline Lewis's. Somebody had to count them because they were going to get taxed for them. I'm just saying. That's, that's true. That's true. That's true. But you're going to all, you'll never forget. How many fish? 153. You'll never, see, you'll never forget. It's I do. I always think it's 157. I always slip. Horacle brilliance on John's part. <laughs> Once again. Once I love John for that. <laughs> Once again. Exactly. Uh, can, I, can I move I, to ask? I'm going to come yes. back to you with this. Just so you know, when we talk about revelation. Good. And come back All to right. what? Rhetorical brilliance? My rhetorical counting. brilliance? Counting in numbers. Oh. Oh, yeah. Because in I'm revelation, not. there's going to be myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. Yes. Yes. Abundance. Abundance. Yeah. But can I pause it? Can I pause it at X for us? Yes. Um, I, I want to do a teaser alert uh, as we... Uh, we um, enter into this story. So when we were entering into John, um, there was after these things. And um, I love the way that verse one in, in, in Acts 9 begin. Meanwhile, Saul. So it's like we're in the midst of all this is going on. And on the other side of town, across the street, 
all of these threats, all of these murders, all of these attacks, all of these things against this, this promise of God's presence is being done against Jesus or, and against Jesus's followers. And, and I just think that that teaser uh, is a wonderful entry if you're going to be looking at Acts to just recognize that while we're experiencing the good, while we're being witnesses to the good, there is always going to be someone who is threatening against us, who is fighting against us, who hasn't experienced the presence, of, have, hasn't had an encounter with Jesus and are, is not going to understand what it is we're doing. And if we're doing it right, it is going to be countercultural against our normal practices of our religion. It's going to be countercultural against the accepted practices of our culture. And the only way that we're going to be able to move into it, into the abundance and the peace and the promise that it offers is if we have an encounter with Jesus. So I'm going to say what I've been saying this last uh, few weeks, and that is preach these in such a way that Jesus shows up and people recognize that this is the Lord. Awesome. People should be falling down, unable to see this Sunday. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> or they should be showing up in in um the ananiases of the world i have my own teaser I'm, I'm working on a sermon on this text for the festival of homiletics in denver in a couple of weeks so i'm really hoping you two can help me with some some details all right uh, if you're going to preach on this text by all means go through verse 20 if you're just reading it and you're going to refer to it lightly you can stop at verse six but if you're going to preach on this this is a story about two men both having encounters with Jesus that are transformative for themselves and for the broader church. And that needs to be, that needs to be a focus of, of the preaching, I think. So this is not just Saul's story. Again, it's one, we, we talked about this last week. This is uh, in Acts now, the reminder um, to use your words, Caroline, that, that God is, is loving the world. And so it, 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 just as we have in John, the various ways that people um, recognize Jesus, that's what we have here is, again, it's not an individual story. So definitely, Matt, hold on to that. Um, I don't always agree with the theological interpretation of Rob Lacey uh, in his book, which is kind of a contemporary translation of the Bible called, I believe the book is called Word on the Street. But I do love what he does here to um, ha have us recognize the kind of bully that uh, Saul represents. Now remember, this is a, a, a paraphrase uh, a trying to update. Um, and uh, it's, it's not quite as theologically grounded as say Eugene Peterson's The Message, but it does that kind of flair. Um, um, and, I, and I love what he does because it gets at what you're looking for, Matt, which is the recognition that this is not just about Saul. This is about different people having this incredible encounter and how it transforms their life. Rob misses the fullness of think, I think of what you're doing or what you're calling us to do, Matt. Um, but I do like the fact that he 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 challenges us to look at this in, in terms of real personalities encountering Jesus. Uh, it is, and, and and the and the threat is is tremendous. So I'm wondering how how that gets rendered in in verse one. The one of the things I find that's interesting about it is Ananias looks like a prophet in prophetic call narratives and usually prophets minimize their own gifts or their own worthiness right i'm not the right one to do this work woe to me i'm a man of unclean lips you know what ananias does is he <laughs> he criticizes paul's credentials right yeah. Lord, i've heard a lot about this man i mean it's so that's interesting right what happens when when God calls somebody to the church and those in the church say, yeah, but not them. You know what I mean? That, that, that's part of the prophetic uh, repartee with God or the struggle with God 
it's a reminder, I think, of the communal aspect of, of how Acts is imagining this church of, 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 of people of the resurrection, that it's because Paul is such a, a towering figure in the book of Acts, he's this, he's virtually a superhero with all of his gifts and his cunning. But I think here's this reminder that that he's called into a community and he's going to change that community and that community is going to struggle with him, his personality, his very body, um, as much as his message. And that he wouldn't be called without that community, that, you know, that it, without Ananias, where would Paul be right now? <laughs> it doesn't go well for him, right? At the end of chapter nine, he would have died in the city. They had to sneak him yeah. out in the basket. If he didn't have folks around to help him, he yeah. probably wouldn't have survived the chapter 10. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think that's, you know, you think of the, the call of Paul, right. And, and, uh, and even looking at that in artwork and whatever, and you're just so focused on Paul and then uh, because then Paul goes on to be Paul and, you know, and then he, he wrote a couple of things that end up in the new Testament. So, uh, but yeah, where would he be with uh, without Ananias? And I think that's a beautiful homiletical question. Where would you be without the the ones whom God sent to uh, to inter to intercede and to bring you into the community you find yourself in, uh, or when your you know when your faith is um, uh, feels like you're on the side of the road somewhere, <laughs> and uh, you're at who is your Ananias? I think could be. Can't wait to hear the sermon at the festival. I can't either. I can't either. I can't wait to have it written. <laughs> thanks for your help i've got some notes here i'm preaching on john 20 so yeah we, go. Uh, we all go to our strengths don't we <laughs> yep we go to our strengths yes yes in that venue especially uh psalm 30 any comments about that before revelation well i you wish know, we're all for here but for this yeah go ahead Joy. you know I'm, I'm just going to say uh, Psalm 30 has a real powerful, uh, is the, the verse 11 is real powerful for me just because of the testimony of a woman who was living with cancer and in the midst of it, just before she died, she kept this incredible journey for the nine years of living with cancer as a, a, a third in her thirties. Um, she died before she was 40. Um, but um, in, in her journal, uh, the last legible entry that she wrote was a testimony to God where she says, you have turned my mourning into dancing. And uh, Matt, when we were talking about, uh, um, as I was listening to both you and Caroline talk about uh, Paul, another piece of that is um, um, Ananias, who knows the reputation of Paul before his encounter, has to trust the work of the Holy Spirit in Paul to transform him. And um, that, that's a whole nother turn of what does it mean to recognize that the Holy Spirit can dramatically take the worst and make good of it. And in this woman's life, um, the, the dying of the dying of cancer uh, for the for the seven years that she she actually lived well with cancer in ways that I have often said she lived with cancer better than I'm living without and it's a challenge in in that line uh, turning mourning into dancing and that's what I love about that song. Mm -hmm. And I just yeah, it's took just up our res testimony. resurrection time, <laughs> our revelation time. Sorry. Yeah, it's such a beautiful testimony to just the discovery of new life and to yeah. feeling you're at a dead end. And yeah. um, and of course, for people who grieve, I mean, people who who the fact that it's the Easter season doesn't matter so much to them, but are going to hear in this text a promise that mm -hmm. uh, that grief is. Well, grief might be permanent, but grief's intensity is not permanent, right? Grief evolves and we change around our, our grief. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a sign of hope in here for those who feel like they're just stuck in cycles of, of unending grief and trauma. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, as I said a couple of weeks ago, this is not a prescription, it's a description. And I think that's why Wanda's testimony was so powerful to me, because this is what she said in the midst of dying 
Um, you know, it wasn't me as her pastor saying, oh, you should find the joy in this moment. No, she gave that joy to me. Yeah, yeah it's the kind of thing I could never imagine saying myself because I haven't had to live through that, right? But this is one of the gifts that some people discover right. in those moments. Right, yeah, yeah. So uh, Revelation 5, would it be better if John said, I saw the creatures and the elders and they numbered 48,943? Or, I mean, this is... He will say 144,000 later. So oh, shoot, that's and what have we done with ballpark. that number? You know, what have we done with that number? We've I'm not letting this go. Old. If we're going to talk about this all Easter long, all, all right. Easter long, all yeah. Easter. Okay, yeah, but that that's just the problem, isn't it? Is that when we when we don't see the the abundance, and we play around with what does this symbolize? What does this mean? What is, <laughs> How do I add? How do I divide? And I'm a mathematician. I love doing that kind of stuff. I am but in this particular case, I'm just I'm just gonna I'm just gonna turn back and, and go with Caroline on this. Seek I am paid to interpret symbols. <laughs> that's my yeah, job. That's the well say to describe uh, your job in five words. That's what I say. Although well, I probably we're, seven. Okay, but where I go with this myriads and myriads of voices and thousands and thousands singing with full voice. Uh, I go to the fact that what would that sound like, right? Um, and yeah, and 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 they're singing this "Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered," and to the one who's the on throne, and to the Lamb be blessed, honor, glory, and might forever and ever, Amen. Uh, and uh, and but it's one, you know, it's one aspect of Revelation that that I uh, does doesn't get uplifted or seen, and just how much. Uh, how much language of worship and praise is in the book, which then highlights, you know, uh, again, what, what, uh, what is this, what does this book call us to do and to be? It's to praise the God who is present and who has conquered, <laughs> um, who has won the victory already. And, uh, and of course, uh, that, that revelation actually, uh, is um, it, it's where it, this would be a time I think for a pastor too, a preacher too, to make connections to how much revelation is used in our worship service on a daily basis. For uh, for those of the Lutheran tradition, this is the hymn of praise. This is the language of the hymn of praise that we sing in our liturgy. Uh, this or uh, this is also uh, there are. Uh, I'll see if I can get this right. I think there are either 90, I think there are 93 or 91 hymns in the Evangelical Lutheran Book of Worship that are uh, attributed to Revelation. There were 71 in the LBW. So hymn writers got Revelation. <laughs> there are seven Beatitudes in the Book of Revelation. Uh, so it is, it's, it's, uh, yeah, that's, this is, praise uh, for what God does and who God is. And that's so what I'm you're saying. saying is there are about a hundred hymns. Right. Right. Let it go. <laughs> a lot. Okay, Matt. It's another one of those texts that, right, you, you don't need to spend a lot of time interpreting for people. No. You need to call them into participating in it and, and yeah, say, right. where, where, do, where does our worship fit in this, in this heavenly worship? And yep. uh, it's a beautiful scene, especially if you think, I like how you talked about volume and what would it sound like and 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 to play with that in especially if you're in a small congregation or if you're in a congregation that uh, we still we're still masked in my congregation and singing the choir sings with masks. I mean, what does that do to how we think about the resonance of worship and, and, and what are we participating? Yeah, and that your voices, the voices in your congregation, are now adding to the myriads yeah. and the thousands. Yeah.